Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So today we have the pleasure to have uh, Professor Dan Stamperkorn as a speaker of our joint uh, physics department and uh, uh, International Institute of Physics uh, Colloquium. Professor Stamperkorn, uh, he uh, received his undergraduate degree in, the, in physics from the UC Berkeley in 1992. Then did his graduate studies at MIT. There he performed uh, the first studies of Bose-Einstein condensation in an atomic gas in the group of Professor Wolfgang Ketterle, for which work for which uh, Ketterle received the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in 2001. Thereafter, then worked with uh, Professor Jeff Kimball uh, at Caltech as a postdoc. In 2001, uh, Professor Stamper Kern joined the physics uh, faculty at Berkeley. He maintains a research group that explores uh, quantum optics, material science, and precision metrology using ultracold atoms. He's a recipient of fellowships from the Packard Foundation, the Sloan Foundations, and the Miller Institute of the Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering, and the Carl Friedrich von Siemens Research Award of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. The title of the, uh, today's colloquium is Atoms Interacting in an uh, Interesting Optical Lattice. So please, uh, let's welcome Professor Dan Stamperkern. Um, thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to stand before you. Um, hopefully I will do an okay job representing um, not just uh, my own work, but uh, at least for the first 15 minutes or so, uh, broadly the work of, of this entire field uh, that is involved in, in this uh, notion of quantum simulation with ultra-cold atoms. Many of the um, experts in this field are also mingled into this audience. Um, and they uh, also should be uh, giving such a presentation. So I hope that uh, they won't um, uh, frown on me for my representation of their work. Um, so let me start off with some sort of general comments to get us stirred up about the prospect of uh, quantum simulation with ultra-cold atoms. And as um, Caden pointed out earlier in the conference, wearing this sort of headpiece um, makes me feel like some sort of uh, inspirational uh, speaker. Maybe I'm trying to sell you something. So I'm going to try to sell you the concept of quantum simulation with ultra-cold atoms. Uh, it's available uh, in the booth or, um, or online for $29.99. So um, here's the notion of uh, quantum simulation, if you will. And I'll speak about it first in the context of uh, condensed matter physics, which is maybe the one that is been the context of most of this uh, conference and of really most of the work. So, you know, how does uh, condensed matter physics or materials research uh, proceed? There's sort of uh, two ways in which you can approach uh, a condensed matter uh, physics problem. Um, one is to uh, identify a material of interest and, uh, and then explore its properties. And so you make certain measurements, you find certain uh, consequences, some certain results, and now your task as a uh, physicist is to try to explain what is going on. So you construct some sort of minimal, minimal model that you think might describe your system, and then you uh, hand it over, at least these days, to your uh, computer to sort of simulate the thing numerically in software um, in order to see if you can uh, predict the properties that you've measured based on the model that you've established. Um, alternately, you come up with a concept first of some uh, model for a material, uh, which may or may not exist yet, and you uh, go ahead and use your head or numerical simulator to uh, figure out what the properties might be, and then you go and search for a material that might be described by the model you've set out to see if maybe it has those particular processes. So there's this sort of uh, uh, crosstalk between these two um, ways of studying materials, and that's how the field progresses. So the concept behind uh, quantum simulation is to add another uh, element in this sort of um, uh, this loop that uh, creates uh, greater knowledge. And the idea is to, um, instead of taking a many-body quantum model and either finding a real material that maybe is represented by it, who knows, or just simulating it in your uh, computer and s maybe running up against uh, limitations to how well you can calculate the properties of quantum systems, the concept here is that you would create a, an experimental system which very reliably is exactly described by the quantum mechanical model that you're trying to understand. And then rather than run this model forward in like a numerical simulation in, uh, in C code or whatnot, 
Instead, you run it forward as a real physical system. You create the system, you let it, let's say, come to equilibrium, or you kick it, you see how it responds, and based on what you measure as a consequence of, at, at the end of this experiment, you have now learned generally what this many-body quantum model uh, would represent. And um, this can help you understand materials better, it can help you understand many-body uh, physics models better. It also has the property that you can now um, uh, study systems that you might never be able to represent in real life. So uh, one of the aspects of quantum simulation with cold atoms, which I would say is actually the dominant part of the field, is to consider that what we've made in our laboratories are new materials themselves. They're artificial materials that may have no representation yet in nature, but we do know, in our case, pretty well what is the underlying Hamiltonian that describes them. So in that sense, they're sort of idealized materials for this sort of interaction between numerical simulation and analytic theory and uh, experimental findings. Quantum simulation is not limited to the study of condensed matter and materials. It's the study of many-body quantum physics, and so it might also apply to other areas where many-body quantum physics or complex quantum physics would apply. So there's um, uh, an offshoot of the field, which I think is becoming uh, increasingly visible and I think is immensely important, which is the application of qu uh, atomic neutral atom and other types of quantum simulators to the study of other th systems. For example, the study of uh, the theories that produce, uh, you know, um, uh, nucleons and uh, nuclei. So, for example, lattice quantum chromodynamics is uh, a numerical uh, representation of cro quantum chromodynamics. It's what we run in our computers in order to simulate the properties of, uh, of these uh, particles. And it's a, it's a very computationally difficult thing to run. And uh, while we think we understand the basics of QCD, in fact, we have very much trouble predicting the basic properties of nuclei. So this is an area where some alternate um, way of making these calculations is tremendously important. Uh, lattice QCD calculations are also something that occupy a major fraction of time on all of the advanced scientific computing platforms around the world. So if you can find an alternate way to make these calculations work better, I guess you've freed up these computers to do other things like mine for Bitcoin or something. So that seems uh, valuable. So, um, so we've heard a little bit about this uh, in, in talks during this week. There's people at this conference that have advanced this, uh, these ideas for how to make uh, atoms that move in optical lattices start representing theories that, that have you know, the properties of, uh, of quantum field theories, have uh, dynamical gauge fields, have sort of uh, propagating force particles, have uh, Lorentz symmetry, and, and all sorts of things like that. So that's going to be a tremendously important application of these uh, cold atom quantum simulators. Um, it's also, as we've heard at, at the conference uh, this week, there's also applications of quantum simulators for, um, there's, there's other ways of doing a simulation. So uh, just this afternoon we heard about a way of performing quantum simulations where even if you can't make your system actually have the interaction terms that you want to represent, as long as you can make the right set of measurements and you can manipulate your state in the proper matter, a manner, you might be able to find a ground states and properties of a many-body quantum system. So it's uh, a different form of quantum simulation. It use, it's sort of a, a variational approach where you use your system, like in regular variational methods, to kind of look through some candidate set of solutions and find the one that is, let's say, the ground state or the excited state of a model that you want to study. So that's a pretty exciting direction. It's also possible to study quantum systems that are not entirely quantum. It's quantum systems that are also interacting with their environment. And after all, just about every quantum system is an open quantum system. So this is a very important task for quantum simulators. You know, we've developed our theories of open quantum mechanics, let's say in the context of quantum optics, and usually in the context of very simple quantum optics setups. But now we're able to experimentally realize open quantum systems that are also very complex. They're composed of many particles, uh, many modes, and, a, and a, a great deal of sort of mysterious physics. So being able to extend our understanding of open quantum systems to these more complicated many-body settings, I think is going to be a real boon for uh, science. Um, 
what else did I want to say? Yeah, so, okay, so there's, uh, again, people in this audience who, uh, who uh, cover these things. Oh, I wanted to say, I think it also should be possible to use quantum simulators to study uh, physics that isn't quantum physics. So you can imagine, you know, quantum physics tells you that a system evolves according to Hamiltonians and Schrodinger equations, but what about uh, alternates to quantum mechanics that may evolve according to different equations of motion? So I think we can also imagine using quantum simulators that, for example, describe quantum systems that don't evolve in time the way that quantum systems are supposed to. They're subject to extra terms in their evolution. It's sort of uh, an alternate reality that we could study. For example, by making uh, time itself a synthetic dimension uh, within our quantum simulators. So I think there's a lot of potential here. Um, but one thing I want us not to forget is that these neutral atom quantum simulators are made of atoms, and the people that know how to handle atoms best are atomic physicists. And we atomic physicists, we have needs too. I mean, we can't just be serving, you know, condensed matter science and material science and QCD calculators. We have to have our own needs met by neutral uh, atoms as well. So I want to emphasize that another direction that I'm keen to see develop is this sort of uh, return of uh, the methods of quantum simulation back to satisfy the needs of atomic physicists. And so we're already seeing that in the field. There are advances in, so I would say sort of a, a typical goal of atomic physics is to measure things with ever greater precision and have therefore sort of fundamental statements to make about fundamental science. So for example, uh, there's been developments of these uh, optical clocks that make use of many of the tools that also go into neutral atom quantum simulators. And we can now foresee that even some of the fancy stuff that happens within uh, quantum simulation, generation of highly entangled many-body quantum states and all sorts of unusual uh, states of matter can maybe now turn around and make, let's say, better sensors for measuring uh, time or fields better. Um, there's also been a, uh, so for example, there's a work that came out of uh, a colleague in my own physics department that showed sort of as a baby example that there's a particular entangled state, let's say, of two ions, which gives you a natural immunity to noise that would have obscured a measurement. And now that that noise is taken care of, you can use uh, a precise measurement of the property of atoms to measure um, whether electrons uh, obey or have a, a dispersion relation that is isotropic. That is, you can repeat the Michelson-Morley experiment, which showed that there's no ether that changes the, uh, the propagation of photons. Now you can do a similar uh, experiment to see whether electrons propagate in some sort of electron ether as a test of uh, Lorentz invariance. And this was able to establish a, a limit on the Lorentz invariance uh, violations for electrons that is many orders of magnitude better than what had been done earlier. So this is just one example. So now think about very strange, many-body entangled states and what they might give us if we put them inside of uh, a precision measurement apparatus. As a third example, um, as you may know, uh, people are making a lot of very precise measurements using uh, something called atom interferometry. So you, you basically, uh, just like we know how to make uh, uh, an optical interferometer where coherent beams of light are split up into several paths brought back together, and then the interference pattern is read out to determine something, like what happened along one path versus the other, uh, we can now do the same kind of physics with matter waves. So we can now send coherent matter waves of atoms, probably soon also of molecules, and we can send them on a very sort of different path through space, and based on their interference pattern at the end of this sort of uh, uh, circuit, we can determine things. So for example, uh, another one of my colleagues at Berkeley just recently measured the fine structure constant more precisely than it had ever been measured before using such an atom interferometer. So I go over to talk to my colleague and I'm like, wow, that's great. But then he describes to me the interferometer that he uses and it's kind of disappointing. It's like very non-interacting atoms, a very dilute sample, really boring atom optics. And I think to myself, in this room, we're so much better at this. You know, we know how to make big coherent samples of atoms that would be like a laser light within, within an interferometer instead of the light coming out of a light bulb. We know how to create optical lattice potentials where the propagation of matter waves has all sorts of interesting properties. Maybe it undergoes some sort of artificial rotation and we can use that to offset a rotation sensor or something like that. 
So I think there will also be an adaptation of what we've learned how to do in our quantum simulators uh, to improve, let's say, atom interferometry. And that's another area that we ought to develop. All this is happening in the context of a, um, of like a gold rush uh, of interest in quantum science. Um, you might hear people um, walking around telling you that there's a second quantum revolution underway. I'm not sure if there is or isn't. I rather like the idea that those in the midst of a revolution shouldn't talk about it. But um, anyhow, there is a sort of a peaking of interest in uh, quantum science because the public has sort of caught wind of the fact that there maybe is something really valuable in the high degree we have to control complicated quantum systems and measure their properties. So initiatives are underway in uh, lots of places. Uh, the United States is kind of, which is the one I'm paying attention to because that's where I'm going to get my money, um, is, uh, is kind of a latecomer to the game, but they're trying to catch up. And the numbers they're suggesting are really uh, frightening, that they're suggesting that something like $1.3 billion would be dispensed to scientists in the United States over the next five years to study quantum information, quantum sensing, quantum communication, and uh, obviously cold atom physics is going to be a big part of that as well. So there's a chance now for us to engage in um, a really major change. There's a big opportunity that's in front of us now, and I think it's important for us to think about that opportunity and to grab it. I'll also point out that this $1.3 billion sounds like a big number, but I think it is actually going to be dwarfed by the other um, waves of money that are going to wash into this field. So there's this nice site, quantumcomputingreport.com, that tries to keep track of this uh, growing quantum industry. And it lists already something like 100 either uh, small startup companies or major corporations that are now engaged in this quantum science, quantum information research. And the amount of money that they're putting and the, amount of, the number of people that they're putting to this task is much larger than we're thinking about even in academia. So it's a remarkable situation. Um, this plot was shown uh, earlier in the conference. I really love it. So if you, if you want to amuse yourself, you can sort of search the internet for um, market reports on the quantum industry. And some of them are really funny if you know the reality of quantum science. Anyhow, this one is from a guy who's, uh, or somebody, guy or gal, who is trying to advise um, uh, information, corporate information officers about what they should do about quantum science and whether they should bring it into their uh, information technology. So he sort of suggests that there's a typical cycle for new ideas and technology. There's these sort of waves and the suggestion is that after one wave crests then maybe you get into some kind of more steady state where things progress. I'm not sure if that's the case. I think there's also examples of fields that have undergo many, uh, many of these uh, wave cycles but have still sort of at the end actually turned into something. So for example, artificial intelligence and machine learning. This has been hyped in many cycles over the decades. It kind of comes, everybody wants to do it. It doesn't work, everybody goes away, comes and goes, but it does eventually advance. And so I think even you shouldn't really be worried about sort of the bust of, uh, of a first wave crashing. There might be other waves that come as well. But the question then arises to this community of whether we should uh, learn to ride this wave and, and, uh, and use it. So here in Natal, of course, that's natural to think about. And um, I just want to suggest a number of ways in which we can ride this uh, quantum wave. One is to emphasize that I believe quantum simulation is a form of quantum computing. It's maybe really the basic form of quantum computing that Feynman uh, suggested to us is to use natural quantum systems to do the heavy work of simulating uh, quantum systems themselves. But more connected to quantum information research, I think it's also valid to say that quantum simulators are important validators of quantum computers. At, at some point, you're going to build a quantum computer and you're going to wonder whether it works. So you'll run it as a small, on, as a small algorithm. You'll compare it to a, the result of a classical algorithm on your silicon machine that you trust. And you'll say, oh, look, these things match up. So far, so good. But at some point, you'll, the things that are coming out of your quantum computer will be beyond what your classical computer can calculate. So then, how do you still have confidence that your quantum computer is doing the right thing? So here's where maybe it's valid to compare to specific test cases of quantum computation, 
which are quantum simulators, which may not be the most general way to solve all quantum problems, but at least there's some set of quantum problems that they can solve maybe better than any classical computer can, and we can use the results of that quantum simulation to see if our quantum computer works. And I think that that's not, uh, that's not even a pipe dream. I mean, I'll point out to this result that is already now six years old, which was a measurement of uh, the equation of state of a, of a gas of fermions that was governed by a kind of reasonable to write out uh, Hamiltonian, and the experimental measurements on this thing uh, purportedly have an accuracy that exceeds what people know how to do in their numerical simulations. So this already uh, gives you sort of a, an edge to which to compare your uh, quantum computer. Um, I also think that as if you are engaged in the task of building quantum simulators, after all, you're also basically building everything that goes into a quantum computer. Um, you're probably learning basically what quantum entanglement is and what quantum information is, and that's valid uh, across all fields of science as well as quantum computation. And I think, as I said earlier, the effort to build quantum simulators is also the effort to make better quantum sensors, which is one of the prime uses of these, uh, this wave of quantum technologies that may be coming to us. So now I have this motivational speaker thing on, so I'm going to try to motivate you. So it's possible, right, that for something like the next 10 years, right, before this all crashes and everybody figures out it was a bunch of baloney. So within the next 10 years, things might be pretty good. We might be part of this big wave of public interest and finance for the endeavors that we're engaged in. And how do we want to seize those opportunities? So if, and especially I think the younger folks who are in this field in the audience ought to think about this, if you, let's say, are given a license for like the next 10 years to be in a field which is, uh, which is replete with resources, um, where you can really establish something big, what's the big thing you want to accomplish? You know, this, this wave may, may wane, okay, so maybe 10 years from now we're all poor, but at least for 10 years, maybe, you have this opportunity to go out to something really big, really important, not sort of making incremental changes here and there, but really go for something big that's really going to change science or society or whatever it is you want to change. So what, what do you want to do? Okay, so that's the thought. All right, so <laughs> now I'll move on to a description of some of the things going on in, in my lab. Um, and uh, now I'm going to talk about some experiments that my group does which uh, maybe violate this really big picture thing. I mean, in the end, you really have to make incremental progress even to make revolutions happen. Um, we work in my laboratory on uh, atoms that move in optical lattices, and uh, our specialization has been to look at optical lattices which have sort of a triangular motif to them, where the typical building block of the lattice is a triangular plaquette. And so there's reasons why the triangular plaquette is kind of a natural place to look for uh, as a building block for interesting science. Um, for one, you know, with three points you define a plane. So, okay, we're moving towards simulations that, uh, that, um, that, that describe matter moving in two dimensions. And two dimensions is, as you may know, kind of a, 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 the dimensions and dimensionality in which interesting things happen that typically violate mean field theories. Uh, secondly, two dimensions or a triangular plaquette is sort of the minimal construction I maybe need in order to describe things under rotation. So for all the physics that uh, describes, let's say, uh, you know, electrons uh, in magnetic fields that are akin to particles under rotation, maybe the triangular uh, motif and a lattice built of such triangles is a good starting point. Um, and third, uh, the triangular plaquette is also uh, a simple building block uh, to build a structure that is geometrically frustrated about. So I will describe that in the next uh, few slides. And uh, in particular, I want to describe that in the context of the kagome lattice. Um, kagome is, I guess, a Japanese word for basket. And they mean this basket. And the way you get this sort of basket pattern is you start with a uh, triangular lattice, uh, like a badly woven basket. And you get rid of um, every fourth site within the lattice. Okay, so I've identified every fourth site within the lattice. And now uh, let's imagine that those are off limits. And the particles can only move in the remaining lattice sites. That remaining lattice um, has this construction. I've shown the bonds with these white lines. 
and it's composed of triangular plaquettes that point either up or down, and they share uh, vertices rather than sharing edges. And the fact that they share um, vertices and not edges ends up giving the system uh, its uh, property of being geometrically frustrated. And so we can exhibit that easily just with uh, this simple cartoon. Imagine I have a number of uh, spins that live on this lattice and the energetics of the system are antiferromagnetic, so the spins want to point in opposite directions. And while I can write down for you easily uh, an arrangement of those spins that is the lowest energy arrangement, just kind of obviously, where the spins all sort of compromise by pointing away from each other at 120 degrees, what happens now is that the conductivity of the lattice is too sparse. And so even though, let's say, on this triangle, I know that one of the spins should point in this upward direction, I can't quite yet determine which of these two remaining spin orientations to assign to these two locations. And that uncertainty end up, ends up sort of, uh, or indeterminacy, ends up propagating throughout this entire system. It gives you a macroscopic number of spin states that all uh, appear to have the same energy. And when you have this sort of massive uh, degeneracy of the system, uh, something has to come in and sort of adjudicate and tell you which is the true ground state. And that turns out to be sort of subtle effects in quantum mechanics. Um, the problem of what the ground state is for an antiferromagnet that lives on the Kagame lattice is still an open question. People have applied sort of heavy numerical methods to this problem and there's still not consensus as to what the ground state of the system ought to be. Uh, it's believed to be a quantum spin liquid but there's a variety of quantum spin liquids that could be uh, the ground states. Um, there's been a number of great experiments recently, I don't want to belittle them at all, on real solid state Kagame systems, which uh, even though they have very weird names, uh, they turn out to represent the Kagome lattice fairly well. And there have been really compelling experiments of late that have shown uh, some quantum spin liquid behavior in these uh, systems. But I think a, a quantum simulator made of uh, neutral atoms that approaches the system from another direction and represents the Kagome lattice with more certainty um, would be a good addition to the field. The frustration of spins on the Kagome lattice also has an effect on the orbital physics on the Kagome lattice. So imagine, so let's ask ourselves, what is the state with the highest kinetic energy in the Kagome lattice? Okay, so high kinetic energy is obtained in a wave function by having kinks, right? So um, the highest kinetic energy is obtained by having a wave function that has a phase that is, let's say, opposite on neighboring sites. That would give you a large kinetic energy. If I let the phase at a site be represented by a vector in a two-dimensional plane, then you realize that I have something kind of like the previous slide. I have now a quantum wave function of just a single particle moving in the lattice that would like to have its phase be oriented in opposite directions on each bond of this Kagame lattice. So once again, I don't have um, a unique ground state, or sorry, excited state in this particular situation. I have a macroscopic number of states, all of which have exactly the same kinetic energy. That's reflected uh, in this band structure. And a band structure that is flat is interesting for many body physics. It means that the system doesn't have an obvious answer for what to do. There's lots of states that have the same kinetic energy. It doesn't know what to do. So think, for example, of, uh, of metals, right? So in a metal, you have a Fermi C inside of a crystalline material. And, uh, the Fermi surface is a lower dimensional uh, shape within this high dimensional uh, uh, energy or uh, landscape uh, of momentum, momentum states, quasi-momentum states uh, of, of the metal. And the fact that in a metal, the physics reduces to a low dimensional space actually simplifies the problems of metals greatly. But what happens to a Fermi gas when its Fermi energy is placed inside of this flat band? Where's the Fermi surface? There is no Fermi surface. We don't know where to draw it. What happens to things like Cooper pairing? Cooper pairing was an instability of the Fermi surface, but there's no Fermi surface. So anyhow, it immediately raises a lot of interesting questions. The interesting connection between orbital physics and magnetism is not new. It's been discussed very uh, richly in the context of trying to understand the fractional quantum Hall states. So again, this is going to be an interesting system if we can get control over it and study it. The way we created in our uh, labs back at Berkeley is using optical lattice techniques. So we take 
uh, a couple of lasers that put out uh, coherent light at these two wavelengths, which have a two to one uh, ratio, nearly precisely. And we send pairs of those beams at our atoms in a plane uh, where all the beams are rotated from each other by 120 degrees. So we have sort of natural triangular symmetry in this problem. It won't surprise you that I can create a variety of triangular lattices with this kind of configuration. And then we use just some standard optical interferometry methods to make sure that the lattice that is created by this infrared color light and by this green uh, color light are overlapped in the right spatial manner with one another. And that allows us to do something like this. We can make a triangular lattice with green light. Okay, and that triangular lattice sucks atoms onto the places where this green light has minimum intensity, it turns out. So I've kind of highlighted those points with these green dots. So that would be a triangular lattice for ultra-cold atoms in which we can study the physics of atoms and triangular lattices. And now we add on top of that another uh, pattern, now from the infrared light that's interfering in the same plane. It turns out that this infrared light attracts atoms, and it ends up pre preparing overall uh, an energy landscape that looks like this, which is the Kagome lattice. I have triangular lattices that are joined by uh, their vertices. So that's kind of how we paint this uh, Kagome lattice uh, in real life. Okay, so now I'll tell you a couple things that we do with this system. Uh, one of them is studying the effect of lattice geometry on the, on the motion of particles. And in, a, in some sense, it sort of harks back to standing questions in condensed matter physics for um, how electronic phase transitions and structural chain transi phase transitions are related to one another. So there are many materials in material science where a structural phase transition, like a distortion of the lattice, occurs at the same point as an electronic phase transition, like a change from, let's say, a metal to an insulating state. And the question arises in these systems as to which effect causes which. So, um, and it can be hard to disentangle in a condensed matter system because as the electrons reconfigure what they do, they change the potential that holds the nuclei together and they might distort the lattice. Or maybe what happens is that some distortion occurs to the lattice and then that gets sort of translated into what the electrons do. And it's kind of hard to know uh, which effect uh, led to the overall change. Um, in our cold atom systems, we actually have sort of some independence. Uh, the chicken and the egg are sort of separately controllable. So we can paint an optical lattice that has the form that it has independent of what the atoms are doing. And then we can just change the structure and see whether the atoms undergo a transition. We're working with bosons in this experiment. So bosons don't undergo a metal to insulator transition, but they do undergo a superfluid to insulator transition. And that occurs as you start adding uh, interactions to the system where two bosons on the same site have an increased amount of energy. So as you increase the interactions between bosons in these lattices, they go from a superfluid state to an insulating state. And we can ask whether structural changes in the lattice uh, will affect this sort of change in the state of the system. And we might expect that it does. So we can compare atoms that either live in this triangular lattice or this Kagome lattice. And you'll notice just by looking at what each uh, lattice site is interacting with locally, that uh, in the triangular lattice, there's a greater deal of coordination than there is in the Kagome lattice. And we might expect that because of that, sort of this increased connectivity of the system, uh, transport might be more ro uh, robust. So superfluids might be more robust in the triangular lattice than they are in the Kagome. So the way we test that experimentally is we pour a bunch of uh, atoms into our lattices, we let, stir them up, let them come to equilibrium, and then we let them fly out of the lattice, and we look at their distribution in momentum space. In momentum space, we can see the presence of a superfluid by there being very sharp peaks in the momentum distribution, such as the sharp peaks you see in these uh, images over here. Whereas when the atoms are no longer in the superfluid state, their uh, momentum distribution is sort of a big, broad mush. And that's what you uh, see in these images over here. And so you'll notice that, let's say, at a particular strength of the lattice, in fact, going from the triangular lattice to the Kagome lattice makes a superfluid become non-superfluid. So that's the change we were looking for. But this is a very qualitative picture. Well, it's nice to have a qualitative picture, but I wonder how quantitative we can make it. And again, the role of atomic physicists is to make precise statements. So we can ask ourselves, can we make, with the system we have, a very precise test 
of many-body quantum physics, or that is, of the predictions that I have for a particular many-body quantum model, can I test those with very high precision? You know, in condensed matter physics, it maybe would be really foolish to try to make precision measurements. So you can ask, can I make a precision measurement of like the resistivity of aluminum? And that's not interesting to do because, well, I'd, first of all, I don't have any theory to compare it to. And secondly, I don't have any really pure aluminum to play with. Um, but in this case, where we construct our systems very precisely, I think it's a valid question to really test with high precision what's going on uh, in a physical system. So in our case, we're going to try to make a measurement of this uh, phase transition with very high quantitative precision. And we wouldn't be the first to do this by any means. There have been a number of great experiments that have examined, in particular, what is the point at which this phase transition from one state from the superfluid to the mod insulating state occurs. And so you go look up at these papers. They're beautiful papers, but they also have the, pro the problem that they achieve only moderate precision. So, you know, compared to atomic physics experiments that are measuring things with many, many digits of accuracy, here we're only approaching sort of a 10% uh, agreement with theory. So uh, what's the deal with that? And the reason why these quantitative tests are difficult in our quantum simulators is because of some of their own properties. So two things in particular. One is that the atoms inside of our uh, quantum simulating container have a non-zero temperature. They have some amount of entropy in them. We don't actually know the entropy terribly accurately, so we don't know really at what temperature we should compare to the phase diagram. So that's a little difficult. A second thing is that the systems that we study in our labs are very often inhomogeneous. And so in an inhomogeneous system, being able to tell where exactly a phase transition occurs is kind of a difficult thing to do. But so we kind of looked around. We realized that there is actually a way to use our quantum simulator still to make a very precise test of a theory in spite of those sort of difficulties. And the thing we decided to focus on is a prediction that comes out for the Bose-Hubbard model uh, when you treat it according to mean field theory. And that um, prediction states that the, uh, if I look just locally within the system, the state variables of the system, which would be the number of particles per site, the number of condensed atoms per site, and the entropy per site, are all given as some sort of uh, equation of state depending on these three uh, intrinsic quantities of the system. The chemical potential, the interaction energy, and the thermal energy all when they're scaled by some quantity. So the fact that all, that all these energies would be scaled by the kinetic energy, this quantity J, is a pretty trivial statement. You have to measure energy in some units. But the fact that um, you scale all these energies also by the number of nearest neighbors in the lattice is actually a pretty non-trivial statement. It says that every lattice is exactly the same from mean field theory's perspective. The only difference from one lattice to another is the number of nearest neighbors. And once you account for that difference, this equation of state is universal. Now, this scaling hypothesis, which emanates from mean field physics, um, uh, you know, could potentially also remain valid outside of mean field theory. So, you know, the specific form of this function is something that's predicted by mean field theory. Maybe it's predicted by some other theory. But the scaling behavior itself might be something that we can test um, in, a, in, a, in a broad sense. Okay, so this uh, scaling relation can also be extended to inhomogeneous systems. If we, again, consider this sort of local treatment of the system. And now we find that three uh, macroscopic quantities, the total number of particles, the total number of condensed particles, and the total entropy of the system are, again, uh, properties of some scaling function. They're scaled uh, functions of these three scaled energies, the chemical potential at the center of the trap, the interaction energy, and again, the thermal energy when scaled by Z times J. Okay, so what do these equations mean for us? They mean the following. Let's say I have a quantum simulator in which I have a number of atoms, and I have a total entropy within my gas. The total number of atoms, it turns out we can measure, so I can tell you what that is, but the total entropy of the gas, I can't measure very well. But let's assume that at the same total entropy, whatever it is, I introduce the gas to two different lattices. I either adiabatically translate it into a triangular lattice with this number of nearest neighbors, or a Kagome lattice with this number of nearest neighbors. And I compare properties, doesn't matter which ones I do, but I compare properties of the two systems, also under the situation where U over ZJ is the same. 
So now what this means is the following. I have here three equations, and there's a total of six unknown quantities, uh, three on the left and three on the right. But by construction, my experimental system has already fixed three of these quantities. The number in the, in the two cases is the same, the entropy in the two cases is the same, and the scaled, energy, the scaled interaction energy is the same. And that means that everything must be the same about these two systems. It doesn't matter what I measure. If the scaling hypothesis is correct, then properties of this Kagome lattice uh, gas and the triangular lattice gas should be exactly the same under these conditions. So that's something we can test. So we go ahead and we count how many atoms are in the sort of peaks within that momentum distribution, call that the coherent fraction, and plot that as a function of this scaled variable u over zj. So since I'm starting with the same atom number and the same entropy in these two experiments, where I measure either in a triangular lattice or a Kagame lattice, I expect the data to collapse onto each other perfectly. And we see that they do, right? Um, here, the gas is deeply superfluid. Here, the gas is mostly insulating or normal. In between, it is whatever it is. I don't even know at what temperature this comparison is made. It doesn't really matter. The point that they overlap with each other perfectly seems to fully support the scaling hypothesis. And we can make that comparison quantitative just by asking how much I have to slide one data set to collapse it onto the other. And we get uh, a factor that is what we expect from this uh, scaling uh, equation. The results themselves are a little bit uh, weird because the scaling hypothesis comes out of mean field theory. And mean field theory, we know, is just an approximation. And it's an approximation which is particularly bad in two dimensions, as I said earlier, but these are two-dimensional systems. So it's, uh, it's something to discuss maybe afterwards why this worked out so well. Okay, so let me move to another uh, set of experiments where we've now started playing recently with a different type of uh, triangular motif lattice. And it uh, just came, you know, it came out of um, playing with Mathematica and uh, realizing that if we just make a slight change in our system, we change the polarization of the infrared light that goes into our setup and we slide the lattice to a different location, we get to another high symmetry lattice. And in this case, the infrared li uh, light introduces a potential well in the middle of the upward pointing plaquettes of the triangular lattice and a potential hill in the middle of the downward pointing sites of the Kagome lattice. And the result of that is this kind of um, potential uh, drawn over here. So let me uh, kind of blow it up and highlight it for you. So it's made up of, again, uh, triangular plaquettes pointing either up or down, but there's an inversion symmetry that is broken in this lattice so that the up pointing triangles and the down pointing triangles have distinct characteristics. So if I simplify this to sort of a cartoon drawing, I have a lattice where there's strong coupling in, let's say, the upward pointing triangles, there's weak coupling in these downward pointing triangles. So this has been named either a trimerized Kagome lattice, right? It's been, it's been made into a lattice of trimer plaquettes that are all coordinated to one another. It's also called the breathing uh, Kagome lattice because you can imagine that the, the you know, the, the upward pointing triangles have, uh, have breathed out and the up, up, downward pointing triangles have breathed in, so that's kind of a description of that. Anyhow, this uh, breathing or trimerized Kagome lattice is familiar from the literature. Um, there's been a lot of theoretical treatment of uh, antiferromagnetism in this trimerized lattice for the reason that people wanted to understand what the ground state of the regular Kagome lattice was, and here was a way to approach that problem numerically that wasn't so complicated. Um, there are, again, materials in condensed matter that realize this lattice. This one in particular is called diammonium quinoclidium vanadium oxafluoride. Rolls off the tongue. Um, and, uh, and it was also a lattice that was actually foreseen in the very first suggestions to uh, atomic physicists to make Kagome lattices in their lab. And uh, we're going to study in particular the Bose-Hubbard physics, so again, interacting bosons in this lattice, a lattice that is now broken inversion symmetry, right, where the coupling, let's say, on the up-pointing plaquettes is strong compared to the coupling on the down-pointing plaquettes. And we'll try to get at some of the physics that the Bose-Hubbard model should have in this case. Okay, so our method of uh, probing this system has been to look at uh, momentum space images, and from those momentum space images measure the structure of spatial correlations inside of this lattice. So let me tell you how that comes about. 
imagine we have a, a lattice filled with a, a single atom per lattice site. Uh, each atom is in the ground state, so it occupies sort of this Gaussian Vanier state at the location of each lattice site. In the uh, mod insulating limit, so in the, ins in the limit of you know, infinitely strong interactions, the ground state for the system is a perfect mod insulator where an integer number of atoms, let's say one, will occupy each of these lattice sites and there'll be no phase coherence from one, one lattice site to the next. Okay, if you take this quantum insulating gas and you examine it in momentum space, here's what you see. Um, this one Vanier state at this one site expands. So if this, for example, starts off as a Gaussian, then we'll end up with a Gaussian in momentum space. And then uh, what we see is the overlay of the momentum space distributions of all of these lattice sites. And because they're incoherent with one another, the total distribution we get is just the same as the single particle, as the single site distribution. You just get a big, broad Gaussian with no features uh, beyond that. In contrast, if there is some level of uh, coherence in the lattice, let's say because we have actually some finite hopping within the lattice that can create some sort of particle hole excitations that create um, a little bit of coherence, let's say just at the nearest, uh, at the level of nearest neighbors, then the uh, momentum space distribution will be different. So just focusing on these two sites in particular, what I should see in momentum space is let's say an overlay of these two somewhat coherent momentum distributions, uh, one of which has this extra phase factor because it's translated physically in its origin from the other, from the, the green one is translated from the blue one. And as a result of this phase factor between, let's say, the blue site expanding and the green site expanding, and the presence of some non-zero coherence between the two, we expect to see something of an interference pattern in our momentum space distribution. And that'll occur um, actually specifically with a modulation wavelength, which is exactly the reciprocal lattice spacing. If there was longer range coherence in the lattice, then there would be finer scale modulations of this. You'd build up sort of a multi-slit interference pattern. But in our analysis, we're gonna just focus on this softest modulation that can occur in momentum space in order to quantify the coherence between just the nearest neighbors in the lattice. And uh, so what do we expect to see? So let's say we're examining the momentum space distribution in this direction. It turns out that in our image, in our momentum space distribution, we'll be making a measurement of the coherence between nearest neighbors that are spaced along that direction. So we'll get information on, let's say, these guys and these guys, and whether there's any coherence either between the A and the B or the B and the A uh, bonds within the lattice. Um, that's true also within this trimerized Kagome lattice. But now imagine we uh, weaken the strength, let's say, of these dashed bonds. So in the case that we don't have this inversion symmetry breaking, like in a regular Kagame lattice, I would expect the coherence on this bond and the coherence on this bond to be diminished as we go into the mod insulating state, really with equal measure. So I expect that as I go deeply into the mod insulator, this nearest neighbor coherence should be attenuated. In contrast, uh, in this trimerized Kagame lattice, if we mean maintain the strength of these strong bonds, even as we weaken the strength of these dashed bonds, then I expect uh, this term to go away. I expect there to be no coherence between nearest neighbors on this bond, but I might expect some coherence to persist for the nearest neighbors along that bond. So we're looking for uh, some persistent coherence even as we drive deep into the mod insulator, and that's uh, exactly what we see. So here's, again, the measurement of the nearest neighbor coherence from these kinds of time of flight images um, measured for either the trimerized Kagame lattice or just for the triangular lattice, which has uh, inversion uh, symmetry in it where all the bonds are the same. So if I focus on these uh, triangular lattices first, this is sort of what the momentum space distributions look like. Uh, over here, not so deeply into the mod insulating limit, you see some residual modulation of the time of flight pattern. This is clearly not just a Gaussian. So that means that there's some residual coherence between nearest neighbors. Whereas when we go deeply into the mod insulator, that nearest neighbor coherence is washed out and it has the scaling that we would expect it to just based on uh, perturbation theory. In contrast, here in the uh, trimerized Kagame lattice, we see that even as we drive the system deep into the mod insulating regime, we still retain a lot of coherence, which we believe is on these strong bonds. And you see the time of flight patterns show really a great deal of modulation still, showing that there is still significant coherence within the system, even deep in the mod insulating regime. 
But how do we ascribe this signal maybe to the strong bonds within the lattice specifically? So here we, uh, we borrow a technique from other people in the field. We, um, we impose a phase shift on, let's say, all the sites A within the lattice while leaving the phases of the wave functions and all the other B and C sites of the lattice untouched. So what would that do? It adds, you know, when you add a phase to one site within a two-slit interference pattern, uh, the interference pattern shifts or it acquires a, a complex phase which reflects sort of a spatial shift of the, of the pattern in space or in, in momentum space. Um, the imposing a phase on this site A, it adds, let's say, an e to the i phi to this particular expectation value on this uh, lattice, on this uh, bond. And it, because here the A site is on the other side of the bond, it adds a phase e to the minus i phi. So both terms that we see expanding in that direction will both be affected by this phase that we've imposed into the system. Now let's imagine we extinguish the strength of these dashed bonds, and what do we expect to see? So in this case, the strength of the bonds between A and B and between B and A are the same. So we expect these magnitudes to be the same. And if I look at this expression, I expect just to see something like this cosine modulation in momentum space. So if I fit those momentum space images, I'll see only a term that has the alpha in it in this kind of expansion, but I won't see anything that goes like the sine or a shifted um, uh, interference pattern. In contrast, if, uh, if I perform that kind of experiment in this trimerized Kagame lattice, I expect there to be a strong signal still from these bonds, whereas the signal from these bonds wafts away. So now the distribution I get should be really just given by this term. And that means now in momentum space that I should see both uh, cosine and sine modulations within the momentum space distribution. Uh, and in fact, we do so. So as a function of the time we've imposed these phases, we see sort of an interference pattern that sort of cycles through a uh, cosine or a sine modulation in the momentum space distribution. And we find in particular that, um, you know, in the regime where we have this persistent um, coherence out in the deep mod insulating regime is exactly the region where all the coherence lies on one of the bonds and not the other. So the correlations within this, the spatial coherence within this uh, strongly interacting gas inherits the momentum, the inversion asymmetry of the lattice and it becomes itself uh, in, uh, in, uh, asymmetric under uh, spatial inversion. Okay, so that tells you what I wanted to say about our lattice experiments. Um, there's a number of other things that I um, could have told you about and I will take 10 minutes uh, to do so. So uh, here's other things that are going on in my group. Um, where we do experiments on uh, magnetized quantum fluids uh, and that has led us also to get involved in, um, in understanding what to do with cold atoms in space. So those of you who are old enough will remember the Muppets where they talk about pigs in space. So now we're going to replace those pigs with neutral atoms and see what happens. Um, so here's a picture of the uh, International uh, Space Station. And right in the middle of this International Space Station is a little capsule that the, uh, that the Americans, sorry, the United States, everybody's American here, um, that the United States uh, has laid uh, claim to. And within that uh, central uh, in, uh, region, that central pod, there's a little sort of 19-inch rack. It's not exactly a 19-inch rack. And uh, earlier this year, um, some astronauts flew up this uh, box. It's kind of cool. It's like a cardboard box that's wrapped up and whatever. And they shoved it in this capsule. They flew it up to the uh, space station, and they installed it. They pressed the button. Actually, installing it took some effort. And they pressed the button, and then sometime afterwards, it's been making uh, Bose condensates uh, in orbit. So that the, the ISS, which is passing overhead every 90 minutes, it might have passed overhead during this talk, um, is capable of making rubidium BECs and studying them uh, in the free fall of space aboard the ISS. Um, well, this picture is also amusing because there's this a number here, 250 kilograms, and it turns out that late in the game, they found out that there's a really strict weight limit, a mass limit, on how big the instrument can be when it goes up there, and we thought, is it because you know, you're burning up too much fuel in the rocket or is it because you're worried that like, if you shove around a box you know, it might crush an astronaut or something like that? No, it turns out that the weight limit is entirely given by this crane right here. Um, <laughs> and it, this is just 
one of, I think, four different facilities that can fly things up to the space shuttle, uh, to the space station, and this one has the lowest rating. And so based on that, everything has to weigh less than 250 kilograms. So sometimes you, you learn these things uh, the hard way. Okay, so, um, so this uh, Cold Atom Laboratory is now available for, uh, as a user facility, so at least for United States scientists. We can go ahead and propose ideas for what to do with this instrument, and there's procedures to go through, and we can actually require NASA to run an experiment and send us the data down, and maybe we can publish papers on uh, what they do. And in fact, you don't have to be um, a PhD scientist to suggest. I think you can be like a, a high school kid. If you come up with a good idea, there's channels by which you can force NASA to run your experiment and, and write a paper on it. You can even, you can even be a theorist. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, people are also now uh, looking to the next generation of uh, the Cold Atom Laboratory, this thing called the Bose-Einstein Condensation Cold Atom Laboratory. This one's going to be uh, a joint instrument uh, developed by uh, a team in Germany and then packaged and flown and kind of operated by the United States. And I found myself on, uh, on a team that was in charge of determining what science this thing could do. It's a very strange task because um, this is a user facility. So when it's installed upstairs, users can suggest what to do with it. I don't know what they want to do with it. Do they want to I don't know, do they want to make caparinas with it? I don't know what they want to do, but I have to think of anything that is reasonable. That wouldn't be reasonable. I can think of anything reasonable and then try to make sure that this instrument has the capabilities to do these reasonable things. You know, this is going to be like a, a U.S. German cold atom Swiss Army knife um, that has all sorts of capabilities, and we have to make sure that it can do whatever we need to do in order to make interesting science. So we kind of dreamed up what people might propose to do on this uh, experiment. I don't know if this is what they're going to do with it, but the experiment is going to be equipped to do the following things. It's going to be equipped to uh, run atom interferometers in free fall with very long uh, free evolution times, which is supposed to move us eventually toward making a very stringent test of the weak equivalence principle by seeing if atoms of different mass fall at the same acceleration. Uh, it should allow us to prepare um, uh, plane waves of matter that propagate without falling. They propagate smoothly and slowly uh, within a vacuum chamber that allows us to study simple atom optics and also to look at reflecting these uh, matter waves um, off of uh, materials. Um, there's a variety of studies of Bose condensates that don't have a spin degree of freedom that we're considering. So, for example, at this workshop, Sandy Fetter told us about um, an effort or... A, thinking about uh, vortices that might evolve on a quantum fluid that lives like on a surface. And uh, the point here is maybe to make such surfaces and have the atoms inhabit those surfaces without, let's say, sinking to the bottom of the surface due to gravity. So those might be now possible experiments. Um, there's a lot of experiments that rely on sort of drawing a, a box around a quantum gas. And in the free fall of space, the uh, quantum gas experiences no extra forces. It doesn't fall to the bottom of a container or whatever. So whatever the spin state of the atom is, whatever element it is, whether it's a molecule or not, doesn't really matter. The object will just remain in place. Of course, we need to confine it so it doesn't fly off and hit the walls. So we imagine just drawing a benign box, a hard wall box around it, and now anything we stuff within this volume will be a uniform uh, trapped gas. Uh, and so there's really unique... Uh, capabilities then offered, let's say, to study gases of different spin states and different elements and how they, uh, uh, and, and under homogeneous conditions. And then we also considered, because we knew about this whole quantum gold rush thing, um, uh, that we should allow some uh, experiments also related to quantum information. So there'll be some nonlinear optics capabilities on this instrument as well. So um, I would be happy to take more ideas and, uh, and hear your suggestions, because there's still time to pack this thing uh, with more widgets, and so, um, but only a few months. So if you come up with a great idea, let's develop that idea and see if we can do it. Uh, it should be a great uh, facility. Um, I also have experiments going on with atoms in optical cavities. I won't really tell you much about that. I have an effort to uh, cool lithium and rubidium atoms and turn them eventually into molecules. And then we've just started uh, an experiment to laser cool a new set of elements, and I'll finish up by telling you about that. So um, this has been kind of uh, the thought process. Um, one of the compelling targets for quantum simulators, I would say, 
is realizing topological superfluids. So I won't go through what these things are because I don't even know fully what they are, but they're superfluids which have sort of a certain internal uh, sense of rotation. And as a consequence of that, they have interesting edge modes and also vortices within this system end up having interesting bound states, sort of Meyer on a fermion states at the cores of vortices. And that becomes interesting for things like quantum information science. So um, people have thought about how to make these sort of topological uh, superfluids also in condensed matter physics. And uh, so here's an illustration of how it would work in condensed matter physics. And there are experiments that actually do this. So they take uh, a superconductor filled with superconducting electrons. And on top of that, they place like a one-dimensional wire in which the bands of the motion of electrons inside of this wire are strongly spin orbit coupled. And now it turns out that if you um, fill this wire to the right level, you set the chemical potential at the right height, then the Fermi surface, which in one dimension is just two dots, would be comprised of this dot and that dot, has the property that the motion of the electron and the spin of the electron is perfectly correlated. Moreover, uh, intera so interactions between the electrons uh, uh, in this wire that would maybe prepare uh, create Cooper pairs would create Cooper pairs where uh, in the Cooper paired molecule or pair um, uh, the particle that is going in this direction always has a spin pointing in that direction and the particle going in that direction always has a spin pointing in that direction. And that kind of Cooper pair, it turns out, uh, creates edges at the edge of the wire that are these Majorana fermions. So your ingredients to make topological superfluids in one dimension, and by the way, this idea also works in two dimensions. If you have two-dimensional spin orbit coupling, you make a Cooper pair where, again, regardless of the direction of the particles within the Cooper pair, their spin couples to their motion in a way that sort of contains this sort of uh, circular polarization. Okay, so the ingredients to prepare topological uh, superfluids or superconductors is to have fermions, to have particles that interact, to have strong spin orbit coupling, so that's going to be important, and uh, also to have the ability to have uh, a gas, let's say, in which two different spin states of the same atom might be able to hang out with each other for a long period of time. So these ingredients have all been realized in cold atom experiments. So how exciting. We could probably make topological uh, superfluids in the lab also in a cold atom experiment. But it's hard to get all of these ingredients in the same atom, turns out. So here's our uh, periodic table. And there's a lot of elements within this periodic table that have been brought into the quantum degenerate family. I like the idea of a degenerate family. Um, so uh, for example, there's all these atoms, these alkali atoms, alkali earths, also the half-filled shell of uh, chromium and some of the two electron atoms. And these atoms all have the property that they're uh, their ground state electron configuration has no angular momentum, okay, which makes things simple, but also makes things to some degree too simple. It turns out that this spin orbit coupling, which is necessary for the formation of these topological uh, superfluids, um, in this case requires you to drive the system with light that is very close to the atomic resonance. And the light that's close to resonance ends up causing a lot of spontaneous emission and a lot of heating, and that's difficult to accommodate. Okay, well, there's other atoms in this degenerate family as well. So there's, let's say, these uh, lanthanide atoms, these really bizarre atoms with huge values of the orbital angular momentum. These atoms have a very strong anisotropic interaction with light, even light that's very far off the atomic resonance. But unfortunately, these atoms are also very strongly magnetic. And so if I make a gas that is composed of several spin states, it turns out that they sort of relax and decay due to dipolar interactions and become maybe spin polarized due to trivial reasons. So this is sort of a Goldilocks question, like is there something between the too simple and the too complex? And so we thought about that. Is there anything within the periodic table that still works? And here we really had to exer exercise our skill of being atomic physicists and think of, you know, go look through our textbooks and figure out what atomic physics is. And uh, we found out that yes, the answer is uh, yes. In fact, the elements within the titanium group and the iron group um, all have the properties that we want. They all have uh, a value of uh, the orbital angular momentum in the ground state that is non-zero, but also not enormous. They have uh, states that are uh, very weakly magnetic, so they should not undergo dipolar relaxation. They have bosons and fermions, and they can all be laser-cooled. 
So uh, we're trying this. So we've decided to try to laser cool uh, titanium. So here's uh, titanium. Titanium has a number of uh, isotopes. This is a table of the isotopes. So it, it has five stable isotopes, all with you know, pretty reasonable uh, fraction. It turns out that titanium has so many isotopes because it's a nearly double magic nucleus. It has nearly the magic number of both neutrons and protons, and that gives it a lot of stability, so adding a couple extra particles is no big deal. And uh, so, you know, several of these are bosons. There's also a couple of fermionic species. The laser cooling scheme is uh, a bit unusual. It turns out that laser cooling the atom in its ground state is uh, not a great idea. But laser cooling the atom in one of its metastable states is a very straightforward idea. So in this particular metastable state, the A5F5 state, it turns out the structure of titanium is one where there's three spin polarized D electrons that live on a core, and then there's this one uh, S electron left over. And you can have transitions where this one S electron goes up to P and comes back. So if I just ignore everything in the parentheses, I have basically potassium and I can just do laser cooling of this object in a very straightforward manner. So there's a cycling transition at 498 nanometers. There's, I think, another one at, uh, at about one micron, which is very narrow, and we're going to be trying to laser cool titanium on those transitions. And if this scheme works, then uh, we can maybe think of moving on to these other elements as well. There's a group in Belgium that has already been laser cooling iron, it turns out. So I think that's already established the method. Now we just have to also make it work for another atom. And as you can imagine, the vacuum in our chamber is going to be awesome. Just awesome. So, okay. So that uh, gets me to the end of this talk. I just want to thank you all for the opportunity and for your attention. Thank you, Dan, for the beautiful talk. Questions?